Right. Yeah, that's really bad. Um, but fluids, fluids, fluids for her. I mean, even if she buys herself a tube, that's okay. kind of what she needs. Okay. Any questions on that, guys? Kind of an interesting one. Um, we're going to switch over to some toxicology stuff just so that you guys know questions to ask in the field again. Um, I will tell you the management that we'll do in the hospital about it as well, but it's not necessarily something that you need to know, but it's just helpful for your educational purposes. Um, and what I'm going to go over here is really the one pill can kill kind of concept. Um, really small doses of things that can really hurt kids. Uh, and you guys are seeing it in the house. If you see a bottle on the counter, stuff like that, it can really kind of help us out when we get to the hospital. Anybody know what those are? Mothballs? Yeah, they're mothballs. What's in mothballs? Does anybody know? I have no idea. Something called camphor. Okay. Um, it's found in a bunch of stuff around the house, especially if you, you know, down here. I, I grew up down here. My grandma probably had this stuff down in her medicine cabinet from 1950. Um, mothballs, Bengay, um, Campophenique is actually something people use for cold source, so it's something to think about. Uh, Vicks Vapor Rub, Tiger Bomb, they are in explosives, so don't let your kids play with explosives. Um, it's actually in some candy in Asia. So some people have gotten sick when somebody brings something back um, and kids ingest it and you know, that's something that uh, I'm super worried about. And there's actually an FDA ban on camphorated oils since 1980 because um, one teaspoon can actually kill a kid. So that's kind of a toxic dose where you can really measure it. But a lot of symptoms for toxins, um, you know, they can include nausea, vomiting, uh, these kids get delirious, they start to hallucinate, they can have seizures cerebral edema, and it's as quick as 5 to 120 minutes after exposure. So it's something that can happen extremely quickly. Um, especially if somebody calls you to the scene, oh, my kid ate a bunch of these, you know, be concerned that they might seize, they might lose their airway. Um, it's a neurotoxin. They don't exactly know how it's, um, how it acts, but, you know, it acts both through excitation and depression. Treatment for it, uh, decon or decontamination. There was an Olympic sprinter who actually got um, camphor poisoning because she was using Bengay pretty much throughout her body. And it increases the absorption when it gets hot out. So if people are running, say, a Rochester Marathon or you know, anything like that, 5Ks, um, become concerned about those things. Kind of wash it off with cold water, not warm. Um, activated charcoal won't really help. Um, it's pretty fast gastric absorption. And we wash these people for about four hours if they're asymptomatic. Um, if they start to have seizures, we give them benzos. If you guys have benzos in the upper set, that's what you can give them. Uh, don't believe anybody in any MS sent against me on What's that? Or gel. What's in it? Camper. It's not camper. So it's benzocaine and lidocaine, similar type of thing. We think uh, kids really sick. So it's in baby Oragel, which is still out there. Um, people use it for teething all the time. Um, there's a nighttime formula that's actually worse. And it's in a lot of domestic sprays too. Um, and can happen after uh, you know, people get released post-operatively. So toxic dose is really, really low. If a kid gets a tube and it needs it, they can get really sick. Um, it actually causes hemoglobinemia. Okay? Uh, tachycardia and hypotension. Um, you can get seizures and coma, usually within half an hour to an hour afterwards. And really, these kids get really sick when it's greater than 40% uh, fraction of that hemoglobin. And they'll look, they'll look blue, okay? Uh, it's kind of how they'll look, and you won't be able to get their oxygen set up when you give them supplemental oxygen. This is just one of the pathways that uh, is the benzocaine detector mechanism. The treatment, you're going to give high flow oxygen. All right, the cyanosis is not going to resolve, so don't expect it to. Um, and we get something called methylene blue in the hospital. All right, um, it's contraindicating people with something called G6PD deficiency, uh, and it's category X in pregnancy. The only case of met or met hemoglobinemia I saw was not due to benzocaine, but it was in a 23-year-old pregnant lady. Um, she was blue. She was well. All my family is blue. And she ended up having some sort of genetic problem that was passed on from all the rest of her family, and all of their methylene levels were really high. It was just kind of strange. 
we actually do carry methylene blue as well. Do you? Yeah, we have it in our kits for, uh, for, tox, for tox medicine down here. Yeah. If you if we had access to the kit and we called and had a good enough story and presentation, is that something you would encourage us to call and talk about, or would you rather? That's what the kit looked like. The kit looked asymptomatic. It probably looked just such a transport, but okay. they looked really sick. Yeah, something we definitely have a conversation on the phone about. Um, clonidine. What does clonidine do? What's it for? Anybody? So it comes in pills and patches. Um, it's an old blood pressure med, yeah. and some adults are still on it. Okay. Um, it's also used for. Um, it's also used in opiate withdrawal. Okay. So a lot of opiate withdrawal people go home with little doses of this. Initially, you will see a hypertension. All right. That hypotension and bradycardia. Um, these people can get apneic. They can go into coma. It's an alpha two agonist. So basically what it does is it decreases your sympathetic outflow, um, hence why you're, you get bradycardic, you get hypotensive. Uh, you get a reflex hypertension uh, initially, but that kind of wears off. So what we would do, we would give them charcoal. Um, they come in patches too. So sometimes if somebody ingested a patch, that's an important thing to know. If you see family has patches of fentanyl or patches of clonidine, those type of things, it's really important to relay that to a provider because kids can eat these and they stay in the system much longer, they're much more difficult to get out. So we actually dropped in an NG tube and put about four liters of gold lightly thrown. Um, atropine will work, fluids work, and actually we would go with dopamine for this one just because of its uh, mechanistic effects. And obviously, you can do your ABCs as well. You guys had one just recently. Uh, come out of, I took care of a patient out of Newark. It's a 15 year old female, uh, I think two months ago. 15 year old female, clonidine overdose. That, that, was, actually, that was actually the next question I was going to ask about. Was, uh, it was Narcan, yeah. Yeah. So it's something where you can definitely try it. Um, there's benefits in case reports, there's no randomized controlled trials in kids and tox stuff. Uh, just not big enough numbers, but it's definitely something you can try. And that's going to wear off too. It's going to wear off before your climate team does. So it's something that we have to be. Reduced. Yeah, we're looking at they're looking uh, some pretty high doses out there before the transport happened. Prior to it, did yeah. it help at all? Yes. Yeah. Actually, it did it first, and then it, well, then it, as it wore off, it got worse. So, right. Yeah. Right. So it's something where you might have to redose and transport. Yeah. Um, if these kids are symptomatic, they obviously get admitted. Recovery times about a day to two days. Um, if they're asymptomatic. We usually observe them for 24 hours just because of how long it can act. Uh, beta blockers. What's bad about beta blockers? In kids. What does beta blocker do? So is your heart rate, right? Is that good or bad in kids? Yeah. All right, so it's going to depend on the particular agent. Um, these kids also get very severely hypoglycemic, okay? Um, it, in, these uh, beta blockers actually increase the amount of insulin that you have within your system and you know, will make you hypoglycemic. Uh, Propanolol actually will cause some ventricular dysrhythmias as well and some QRS widening. <coughs> and sodalol is a really long acting beta blocker, which you know, can have delayed toxicity. So consider that for your sign offs and things. If it's a beta blocker in a kid, they got to come in. So, do you guys have a glucagon down here? Yeah. You do? It's expensive. But it's something, you know, that's the treatment basically for beta blocker overdose. Um, it bypasses the entire mechanism and increases the uh, amount of calcium that you have in your cells and therefore increases the contractility of your heart. So, it'll increase your rate. So, decontamination is initially what we'll do within one to two hours. Um, and this is the glucagon dose stuff that we'll, we'll talk about on the phone. But honestly, I would have to look up because it's not something you get very often. The other thing that we do, uh, we give high dose insulin and glucose, okay, for these kids. Um, high dose insulin will actually, you know, cause you to uh, create sort of a sink and you'll be able to uh, increase your heart rate. Um, and obviously, you have to give glucose as well. 
given that's and you're giving them insulin, which is going to lower their glucose. Lipid emulsion is the other thing that you do, which actually creates the sink. Um, it'll draw out the drug from your cells, okay, and from your serum, um, and it'll let you actually pee it out. And most of these kids get observed regardless, um, even if they may, might have taken it, just because it can get pretty bad. Calcium channel blockers, very similar thing. Um, you're going to get pretty much the same type of symptoms, except for you'll have a high glucose level. Um, something you guys obviously can check. Uh, it can be pretty delayed as well in certain formulations. You know, here what it does, um, it decreases the amount of insulin that you release for your pancreas and increases your glucose. What we'll do is we'll do the decontamination um, and you actually give calcium, which you guys can do in the field too. Fluids, atropine. Atropine will really only help after you get the calcium. Um, so you won't be able to augment your heart rate. And glucagon you can try as well. You do use high-dose insulin, you do use lipid emulsion for both of those. This is somewhat similar. With both of those, is the hyper or hypoglycemia, is that happening as the rest of the symptoms are setting in? Or is that yeah. something that we could see yeah, ahead of time of that blocker. might show us that we're going down that road? Right. So that's how you differentiate sometimes. So say they just took one of grandma's pills. Yeah. Um, you don't know which one it was. If you do a BG and it's 200, you know, it's more likely to be a calcium channel blocker. Uh, you will see the hypoglycemia in the same amount of time. Yeah. So that's something to consider. And some of these kids are just lethargic and you know, look like crap. Uh, does anybody know what Lamotol is? It's an anti-diarrheal drug. Something that you can get a hold of. Um, as little as two tablets or two teaspoons. You actually get an anticholinergic toxidrome. Okay. Which is the red is the red is a bead, dry is something. I forget the whole thing, but uh, you're not able to pee at the end of it either. Yeah, yeah obviously some of these people have difficulty. So this might be delayed as much as 12 to 24 hours after the exposure. Um, it has an antagonistic effect on muscarinic receptors. One of these metabolites actually causes respiratory depression, so some of these kids end up intubated. Again, kind of the same hallmarks, what we're going to do at the hospital. We're going to try to make sure that they don't absorb it. Um, Physostigmine is a drug that we would use. Um, it can cause seizures in kids, but we'll still try it. Um, one thing that you have to watch out for if you have any QRS or EKG changes, it can cause you to go into asystole. And if there's any sort of you know, mix uh, picture there, which is also important. You want to get it. Yeah. Particularly, folks, the tox training. What have you guys heard about how to differentiate anticholinergic patient from a sympathomimetic patient? Well, one sympathomimetic patient will be sweating. Um, an anticholinergic patient will be really dry. Right. So if you that, see, but that's exactly what I was trying to get at. So if they're sweating, it's probably not anticholinergic. Um, and if they're if they're completely dry and super tachycardic, red, hot, uh, then that's when I start thinking about anticholinergics. The last case of that I had it wasn't a Pete's case, but um, at Wyoming County, she walked into the emergency department with an empty bottle, like a huge bottle of Tylenol PM, which is basically Tylenol with Benadryl in it, and said she just swallowed this whole bottle. And an hour later, she was intubated, and it was really, I mean, it was a great case of anticholinergic, which is completely delirious and tachycardic. And Benadryl's a bad one, too. Um, you get a lot of disreadiness with Benadryl, but it usually takes higher doses. Does anybody know what's in Sterno? Methanol. Um, so there's a couple of different toxic alcohols we'll talk about. Um, you know, it's in Sterno, it's in paint removers. So antifreeze is a difficult one because ethylene glycol can be an antifreeze as well. But so it's important if you guys are at the scene, take a look and see actually what's in it. Um, snap a picture on your phone just at the ingredients. So toxic dose is pretty low. 
it's usually a kid that gets in the garage and starts drinking something. Um, you can get blindness, you know, most of the time. These kids will be a little hypotensive, tachycardic. They can have seizures. Um, they can have what's called Parkinsonian type symptoms, so they'll be kind of rigid. Um, they'll have tremors. This is just a mechanism that um, creates it to the like, toxic formic acid, which kind of gives you the blindness. Treatment, it's actually ethanol. Um, it used to be a treatment, we don't really get that anymore. But over at the VA, they actually have, a, they have an ethanol formulation that you can give people, which is kind of funny. Flamepazole um, is something that's going to block um, going to that metabolite, to that formic acid. So that's something that we would give in the hospital. Uh, Bicarb is really important because they get severely acidotic. <coughs> um, and we give them folate and other vitamins and things. And we actually can dialyze people with this. Uh, so some antifreeze have ethylene glycol in them. Again, and just another toxic alcohol. Uh, works somewhat similarly. You get the, um, sorry, an anion get metabolic acidosis with it. And you get renal, renal failure with it as well. Pretty much you end up with the same type of treatment as before. Um, so your vitamins as well. And you can dialyze that one too. Does anybody know what that is? Radishes. Maybe. It's not radishes. <laughs> What's that? Yeah, don't eat red berries. Alright? So it's actually a winter green plant. Um, Methyl salicylate is something that's found in Bengay, Icy Hot, and something called oil of wintergreen, which most people shouldn't have. It's in some of that incense stuff. Um, people who are really into burning candles and burning you know, incense, um, sometimes they'll have this in their household, so it's stuff that uh, is important for your history. It is actually in some old food coloring too. Uh, not a good thing. What's in this? Salicylate. Yeah, it's a salicylate. Kind of like aspirin. So salicylates in general, um, if you get enough for a toxic dose, so the first thing that some people actually will complain of is the ringing in their ears. All right, kids, you might not get that as much. It might present as pain. Uh, I have one girl who drank a ton of Pepto Bismol and had pain in her ears, which we really only kind of teased out afterwards that that was um, tinnitus. It does stimulate the respiratory center in your brain, so you're going to start to notice that these people are really tick-giving. And what we will do for them in the hospital, um, we'll give them charcoal. We try to avoid intubation if possible. Um, obviously in the field, if that's something you had to do, you could. But we really want these people to breathe as fast as possible because they're actually breathing out their carbon dioxide and kind of correcting that metabolic acidosis. Um, by getting a respiratory alkalosis. We correct their potassium, and what we'll do is we'll give them a lot of bicarb. We'll put them on bicarb drip because you can actually trap um, the toxic metabolite in people's urine by making them alkalotic. Um, monamine oxidase inhibitors are kind of an anti you know, treatment for antipsychotics. Uh, they're pretty bad as well. You can get tachycardia, hypertension, diaphoretic. Most of these things end up in coma. You get a catecholamine access, so basically your entire body is really jazzed up. Um, you get something called serotonin syndrome. So if you see somebody who's rigid, like a board, um, their reflexes are through the roof, you know, they have clonus, um, those are things to be concerned about as well. Tricyclic antidepressants are extremely bad. If you get an overdose of these, most of these people end up intubated and on drips. Um, amitriptyline and imipramine are the two big ones. So alter mental status, um, QRS widening is a big one as well, so if you see an EKG QRS widening, um, these people need bicarb quick, um, actually sodium bicarb, because sodium is the really big part of that. So it does a lot of different things, these are really dirty drugs, but they block a ton of different receptors. The question really is how much bicarbonate. Um, some of these people take you know, like 12 amps of bicarb just to even start to see any sort of response to it. It's really the sodium that's overcoming some of the reactions in their heart um, that actually helps them kind of 
normalize their QRS interval. So it's something you, where if you're doing a lot of transport, you could um, see EKG changes and then they can actually narrow as you start to move that by car. Um, glide your ride. These are sulfonyl ureas. What they do, um, basically they're for diabetes. They'll cause hypoglycemia in kids pretty quickly and pretty profoundly. It'll be really difficult to get their uh, blood glucose levels back up. It binds to pancreatic beta cells and causes release of pro-insulin, which is basically broken down into insulin. And these kids go and one, get sugar drips, and two, uh, they go on some colotriotide. The other one that I didn't put in here, um, buprenorphine is one that you guys might see more of. That's extremely bad in kids too. All right, they can get respiratory suppression, um, just like any other opiate, but it more profoundly affects kids than it does adults. Um, it's a partial agonist, so most adults won't be able to overdose on that, but kids get pretty sick with it. Does anybody have any other questions about tox stuff? Anybody seen any tox stuff recently? Adults or kids? Overdoses? Mary, you seen anything? Other than your Wyoming County? Yeah, just the, just the one I thought about is probably the most memorable one. Yes, sir. Most memorable. Maybe. Anybody have any interesting adult cases? Nobody? Had a glipizide recently. Glipizide overdose in an adult? Yeah. What did they do? No one has any idea. All we know is that the docs, docs figured out that it was that she had taken uh, too many, too much of her glipizide, and we got to her, and she was a uh, respiratory rate of uh, forty. She was, she was buffing away and wasn't doing anything. Yeah. We, yeah. Where was she? Uh, was she Mount Morris. To? Mount Morris went over to Noise, and that's the last I heard of her. Finish up here, we'll actually do a quick case. Uh, 